The Human Founder Podcast by Gal Blochli Ram. Hi, I'm Gal Blochli Ram and welcome to The Human Founder, the podcast where we speak about the mental aspect of the entrepreneurial journey. Entrepreneurs often describe the emotional roller coaster that is embedded in being an entrepreneur investor. Where you experience the lowest of lows and the highest of highs when you, for example, raise your first round of three and a half million dollars from Andrus and Horowitz. And it's from that place of uncertainty, the need to constantly self-manage ourselves, keep up our energy and be mentally resilient in order to deal with everything. Well, it's not easy. In each episode, I will be talking to entrepreneurs, investors, psychologists, being their sounding board with the goal of creating a space for this less spoken about layer, which is the mental aspect accompanying the entrepreneurial journey. I will also share tips and tricks to help boost your focus, clarity, and mental resilience. Today, I really have the pleasure of having Ido Gino with me. Hi, Ido, and it's really, really nice to meet you. Hi, Esther. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming. I know it was a long journey to come to Israel, and you had so many conferences, and, and, and we made it. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we're able to do it here in the studio together. Yeah, it's much more fun when you're like in real time, face-to-face. So, Ido, you're the founder and CEO of um, Rapid API. You founded Rapid API when you were only 18 years old, and they're considered one of the youngest managers in Silicon Valley. You're also part of Forbes 30 and the 30 list, and a 2017 Thiel Fellow. Prior to Rapid API, you were the co-organizer on ha- of Hacking uh, Gen Y, a hackathon for youth. You have been programming since you were a kid and still contribute to open source projects, originally from Haifa, Israel, and now you live in San Francisco, California. So again, thanks for coming, and, and let's, let's dive deep. What do you say? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So tell me, how a young boy at the age of 18 suddenly has such a big idea, and you know, he's going to take it global into the U.S. market, and tell me about the beginning of Rapid API. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's one small step at a time. <laughs> <laughs> if, not, if, if it didn't become what it is overnight. It's certainly not overnight. <laughs> it's uh, six years of night. <laughs> um, you, you know, it, 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 it's interesting because this is a bit of an aside, but I, in kind of the vein of looking at the unspoken side of startups, I was, um, w- we're chatting recently with Dylan, the, the CEO of Figma, uh-huh, um, yeah. and he shared some stuff um, about kind of their journey and it always looks like an overnight success at the end. Uh, they recently got acquired by Adobe for $20 billion. Yeah. It was actually like a 10-plus year journey to get to that overnight success. Um, so I, it, there's a, like a good saying on it, like it always seems like an overnight success, but it's, you don't realize it's been five years or six years or whatever in the making. Um, Definitely. And, and, and that's some, somewhat what I feel like. So, so like you're very young. You had this idea in, in your mind, right? How, how could it all begin? So it started as a pretty, well, for us, I guess maybe to start with what we do today, we're a platform for developers, helping them create applications, websites, uh, software faster by leveraging APIs, which are basically ready-made pieces of code and functionality that de- uh, developers can embed into their applications. It really started by, especially around that environment, you mentioned hackathons and being involved in organizing hackathons and participating in them and seeing people really try to go and build software more quickly and more efficiently and adopting an agile mindset when it comes to development and understanding all the tools and APIs and systems that need to go into helping developers create software faster. Mm -hmm. And it became apparent pretty quickly just how powerful APIs are as kind of becoming the building blocks of software. Mm -hmm. So when you go and build an application, instead of writing everything from scratch, instead of spending months doing it, you can embed APIs, leverage them, and and build an application or a piece of software in weeks. Um, And I started like, hey, this is cool. Like, all these different things you can, you, if you want facial recognition, there's an API for that. If you want a list of restaurants, there's an API for that. If you want to get a, embed a map into your application, there's an API for that. You want to send a text message, there's an API for that. Let's just create a list of APIs uh-huh. and put them all in one. And, and, and that's like the very humble beginning of, of rapid APIs. Let's you just wanted to make it more efficient, you know, for your usage, wha- right? To find the right API model, to embed it. And yeah, just take all the APIs, put them in one place. And, 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 and that really was, was it in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something that we brought to market initially around a lot of hackathons and events like that of, you know, hey, you have 36 hours to build an application. Instead of spending all of them kind of sourcing for the right APIs and figuring out the documentation and creating the account and all, like yada, 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 all the, the things that you need to do, just go 
to this list, find all the different pieces that you need, and focus on writing code. And that was like V0.01 of Rapid API. Like your MVP. <laughs> yeah, like the minimum viable product. Yeah, minimal, yeah. minimal viable minimum product. Minimum, like yeah. to have a Google Doc and to have like a bookmark. There, this is this API for that and for that. So you go with this idea, which is actually very efficient. It really helps uh, to do things much uh, smoother, faster, easier. And how do you make the next step? Like you find someone who will believe in this idea, will write a f first check, and will actually help you to start build a company on this idea. Yeah. So for for a pretty long time, um, you know, we just kept, or I just kept building the rapid APIs. What it was, a list of APIs, mm -hmm. adding more APIs, adding more documentation and information about the APIs that we already had on the list. And over, it started getting some amount of traction over time. So developers found it in events that we went to, but also just online. We actually on Google started ranking some for search for some searches around APIs and looking for APIs of different types. And I um, met Dov Moran. Mm -hmm. um, well I guess I don't know if he actually needs an introduction. Probably not. But um, former inventor of the USB flash drive and now uh, an investor out of Grow Ventures. Mm -hmm. um, so so I met him and we kind of talked a lot about software and and where the software industry is going. And I kind of showed him a very quick demo of like, hey, like look at the power of APIs and some of the stuff that we've been doing with them on Rapid API, on what would become Rapid API. And we talked also about the API economy. It was just when there was this like big Cambrian explosion of startups that created APIs. So today a lot of huge companies like Stripe, like Twilio, like SendGrid, like Segment, um, that all kind of started back then. And we kind of took, it was actually him who realized, hey, there is a huge, um, potential in this. Yeah, there's a huge potential. We can actually turn this into a, a real business. And I remember quite distinctly, th this was kind of very early on. Um, I met him here in the, the center. I, it was on a Friday. I was at that, part at the end of that particular meeting, all I could think of was like, hey, the, the last train to Haifa is leaving in like 30 minutes and I need to make it to the station. So he gave me a ride. And in the car, I was like, well, yeah, I think I can invest and we can turn it into a company. Um, and that was kind of day one for Rapid API. So what was the first investment? I think it was 500,000 shekels. Um, very, very small check uh, in, in, in today's standards. Yeah, so, so this is how it all began. Yeah. So it's like you have this um, great idea, which at that phase you're not even aware that it's such a big idea. It's just like a tool for you to work. And then you find one of the... Uh, uh, biggest investors in Israel and a prestigious one and like a very, very um, uh, uh, experienced. And he tells you, listen, let's do something bigger uh, for it. And then the next step, like how, how much time takes until you uh, raise the next round of two and a half, two and a half million dollars from MG Slim uh, Horvitz? Well, pretty quickly thereafter, I um, kind of moved to San Francisco also. Mm -hmm. And there are really two triggers. One was Thiel Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Um, so Peter Thiel's organization, basically working a lot to prove that you can found companies and, and have an impact on the world without going to college, mm -hmm. um, which I guess it, it's kind of funny because in an Israeli lens or in an Israeli context, it's not as big of a thing. But in the U.S., college is essentially an extension of high school, right? So mm -hmm. you, you graduate high school, you go to college next, and if you don't, something is seriously wrong with you. Yeah. Um, so he basically has this organization where he said, hey, we can prove that you don't have to, to take nothing that Nothing is seriously wrong with you. Yeah, <laughs> nothing. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say that about <laughs> myself. Uh, but n you can go. You can go to college. You can also take a different path. Yeah. Um, and there is nothing wrong with taking that other path. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think a lot of it. It's it's kind of funny because now a lot of it is also blowing up with people who realize like, hey, we went to college, we got nothing out of it, and we're stuck with mountains of debt. Yeah. Which is kind of how you end up in this whole student debt situation that we're in now. And the whole academy is changing, and the whole uh, you know the way we see it. But like, what were the main learnings that you took from um, the Thiel uh, Fellowship? Yeah. So and and, and I guess just to kind of yeah. complete the story. So Thiel Fellowship, twenty people a year uh, under the age of twenty that end up getting a hundred thousand dollar scholarship to basically start come to the Bay Area, start their company. So that was the, the kind of biggest trigger to uh, to come over and move to the Bay Area. Um, frankly, also the money that allowed me to do that. I how, think did, how did you hear about it? I got introduced to, I was in San Francisco mm -hmm. for a hackathon actually, and mm -hmm. I met a friend who was already a Teal Fellow, and he connected me with the, with the team over there. 
let's say one year. Two years. Two, two years. Wow. Yeah. Uh, two year program. You get and and, and like it's on a daily basis. It's not really on a daily basis. It's more on a weekly or monthly basis. We do events, we, but it's really not the program that was actually that meaningful. Or the, the program was great. The people you got to. Yeah, it's the community of mm -hmm. people that um, that is created around it that is so much more meaningful because they do a phenomenal job of curating some of the best minds of, I think of, of our generation. And I somehow snuck into there. I, is uh, it very competitive? It's somewhat competitive. There's a um, a finalist weekend and an interview process and. Yeah, I was I was very happy to to be able to get in. B but after you w you're in, so like it's the brightest minds, right? You yeah. Feel it, but uh, it's like um, I I have to push myself and I have to it's like uh, to rise, or it's more like a sporting and we're sort of co-creating things together. What's it's the culture there? It, it's more of the latter, and I and I think that it's you probably see it because you obviously work with with founders a lot more, and I you you probably end up seeing the same that I think it's something that's unique to kind of the startup and tech world where people realize like, hey, we can all make, we're not all fighting for the same cake, we can make the cake bigger, bigger. so exactly. let's work together, let's support each other, let's share learnings, and, and that very much translated into that community, which is something very nice, because I think in a lot of other industries, when you kind of get to the top, it's very competitive, and here it's kind of the opposite in, in, in tech as a whole, where you, the closer you get to the top, the more friendly and collaborative it becomes. Yeah, and you mentioned when we spoke uh, earlier, before we started to record, um, that Many of the participants were at the same age like you, right? Young, young children. But it's not that rare to have uh, a guy or a girl at the age of twenty in the Bay Area to start building a startup, uh, which uh, uh, seems on the one hand like very young. But you said I was there as part of a group, which everyone or most of the people were like me. It wasn't like uh, that unique. Yeah, and I th and I think we we'll we really see more and more young people. This is, I guess to zoom out, this is the really great thing I feel about software and, and kind of the new iteration of the, the tech ecosystem. The barrier to entry is just so much lower. If you want to build an MVC, to like our MVC was a freaking document with a list of APIs. If you want to build an MVC, like you can build a website to market it with, with very low code tools. You, if you need to program it, you can learn programming and how to develop software all online. The it's not like before you needed degrees and very expensive equipment, or if you wanted to make a product, you need a factory and um, off-site manufacturing. Like, so anyone can do software. Anyone can get into this space. And I think that a corollary of that is you have young people who, A, have a lot of time, but B, have like a kind of fresh and untainted view of the world and kind of have the opportunity to come in and create new things um, without being kind of blocked by a very high barrier to entry. That's a beautiful explanation, and for for now, I'll let it go. <laughs> but later on, we'll get to it from another angle, um, because I guess, I don't know, I want to ask you about it, but later on, I mean, also establishing a startup at a very, very young age has its problem. It has the its cha challenges that uh, you're not experienced enough in the world of business, and um, is this first time that you address some of the challenges and, and how you address it, but we'll get it. So I'll, I'll just, okay. and <laughs> I'm, I'm going to jump on that for a jump second. Jump on it, okay. Because I, I, it's funny, people always say like, hey, you don't have experience, that's a bet. And I will agree, it, there are cases where there is a best practice or a way to do something. And I'll say in 60% of the, the time, it's actually, there is a reason why it's the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. Like everyone do it, you, and, and there is a reason why you should too. Mm -hmm. But I, and, and, yeah, if, if I had more experience, I would have known that and just gone with that precedent. But the reality is is that there's probably around 40, again, it's the minority, but it is probably 30, 40% of things where people do them in a certain way because that's the way it's always been done. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you come from a lot of experience, you kind of get tainted with that. So there is somewhat of a benefit to, to kind of coming eyes. with fresh eyes. And, and everything that we do in Rapid, it's because we kind of prove for ourselves why we need it. There isn't a single person or a single role or a single function in the company that we have because, be, because I w we have, I know why we have to have it. Uh, I totally agree. I totally agree with this. So, you're raising your uh, seed round yes. from uh, Andreessen Horowitz, and tell me how does it feel? You're 20 by that age, 20 something. I was still, I was 18. I think it, it was, it was still very still early still on. Oh, very yeah. Early on. Okay. How do you learn the job? How do you learn how to do it? How do you mentally stand 
uh, in front of those investors and you know uh, uh, feel uh, confident in what you have and, and what you bring. So oh, I, I, I did. I did not feel comfortable <laughs> with anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Uh, we we had a bit of an abnormal story because we kind of raised that initial check from Dove. We started building the company. We also brought in a few other um, really great names here in Israel, Marius Nach and Arya, um, who kind of were the, the angels behind Rapid API early on. And when we started thinking about, hey, we should go out to market, we should raise a serious round, I was already in the Bay Area. I remember talking to Dove at length about it. He's kind of always been the mentor that I go back to to, to talk about these, these things and how to build a company. And in one of the conversations, I said, like, look, so you're in the Silicon Valley, I'm in Israel, like I'm not an expert about, uh, this is by the way, Dove, super hum he's, he's never the expert, su super humble. I'm not the expert about fundraising in the Silicon Valley, but I have a friend who is. Um, sure, connect us. And like two hours later, I get an email, Ido, meet Ben Horowitz. <laughs> 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 yeah, you have a, a friend who's familiar with fundraising in the Silicon Valley. A friend. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I still have that email, it was, it was quite nicely written. Yeah, it's like, a, it's a moment. Yeah. To remember and something to reflect on to see where it all began and you know your journey, how you evolved in this. Yeah, and I remember so I emailed, of course, I, I said, Hey, Dove, thanks for the intro. Nice to meet you, Ben. And he was very, I was shy. I was probably like, Hey, one of the busiest people in the tech industry, like, it's probably going to take two months. We met in like the same week, which yeah. was incredible. Um, and by the way, I've, I've no this is a random aside, but I've noticed the busier people are. Mm -hmm the more available they are, the quicker they answer emails, the quicker they show up to meet. Like it's because the prioritization process is so developed and they have the sense of exactly you know, where they should put the effort, what do they want to do, what do they need to deliver, to delegate in a very, very, uh, you know, very, it, it works in a very, very efficient way. Yeah, it's almost counterintuitive. Like yeah. the, the people it you expect take longest to, to mm -hmm. respond are usually like the fastest ones. Uh -huh. And the people who can be the fastest are usually the slowest to respond. Anyway, we ended up meeting with, with Ben, and I took, and Jason Orvitz, especially back then, very rarely did early stage rounds. I didn't think we had any shot at, at raising a seed from them. So I kind of saw it as an opportunity to just learn from, from one of the greatest in the industry. And I came prepared with a page of questions. So I showed up, um, it was like a one hour long meeting, and for 55 minutes I drilled the hell out of him. <laughs> It was like, because he also, he has a book, but highly recommended, uh, Hard Thing About Hard Things, mm -hmm. so I re and which I read a couple of times and had fully highlighted, so I, I showed up with very specific questions. You made uh, homework. Yeah, it was back in, in, like, I think, yeah, 2016, when it also seemed like the VC industry might be slowing down, or we might be, like, heading into a downturn. Very much didn't happen, um, but I kind of asked around that and a bunch of um, kind of other topics around building a company. And I think it was like at the very end of the meeting, I had like five, it was like, so you know, like before I ran out of time, what, what are you guys doing? I spent about five minutes pitching Rapid API and that was that. <laughs> um, and, and it worked. Well, the next day I got a phone call from uh, one of the, the admins at, at the firm, which was like, hey, like Ben really enjoyed the meeting with you. He hoped you might come back and pitch the rest of the partnership. So, so it's a really beautiful story um, for early stage entrepreneurs to show that um, Sometimes even you you don't sound like very, uh, uh, this is the desired outcome of this meeting. I'm coming to learn and I'm coming to create a, a relationship and I really want to dive deeper into things and I'm just being me. I just bring myself. And out of it, you know, you left only a few minutes at the end to it, but you were so impressed with you that later on it, it brought the second meeting and, and, and later on the investment. But sounds like you really were uh, authentic and, and true to yourself and I'm really coming here to learn and this is the the, the main thing that I want to take out of this uh, time with you. I don't know if she was impressed or just curious. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's very cliche, but I think it's actually true for, for the startup world where, you know, even if every shot you take has a 1% chance of hitting, like the way to maximize your chance is just to take 100 shots. Yeah. Um. The more you try, there's a chance that you'll uh, succeed. So that happened, and it was like um, six, four, four and a half years ago, something like that. Yeah. And what happens next? Well, we we brought in some more capital. Uh, back then, we had I think thirty five thousand users, uh, so still relatively small. Um, and ever since then, it was just a race to um, 
to grow the number of developers and number of um, of APIs that we have on the Raft API platform. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of straight into product development and scaling mode. Tell me this big vision that you have today and uh, till today you raised over $270 million, right? Yeah. And, and more than 200 people, 200 employees already. So like this big vision, is it something that you had in mind in the beginning? Is it something that evolved later on with the mentorship of Dov and the other leadership that uh, came on board? Is it something that still changes all the time? Like I'm very, very impressed. I mean, although you're very humble and it's like, you know, it's not an issue, et cetera, but it is. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, teaching students at your age at Haifa at University and I'm seeing many young entrepreneurs and it's like you have something so uh, solid and like so uh, grounded on the one hand that just, you know, I go, I do, I do the work and I continue. And on the other hand, it's like you're uh, reaching really, really big milestones um, over time. Yeah, it, it didn't happen overnight, as you said. So. What do you bring this, you know, uh, uh, inspiration and, and, and the vision and the know-how? What is going to be the next step? Where do you want to go? Tell me a little bit about it. I think the, vi the, the big vision has always been the s really the same. And it's not about fundraising. It's not about sales. It's not about team size. It's, it's, it's really just been about, hey, like APIs are the Lego pieces that people build software out of. There needs to be a store or a central place for all those different building blocks of software. Mm -hmm. And we're going to build it. So we're going to enable every developer um, to um, to have a single place they can go to for all APIs. Everything else I kind of see as, as steps in the way of making that happen. And you know, you talk w we talked in the preparation for this about kind of highs and lows. Mm -hmm. One high that's like I actually kind of revised my answer. One high <laughs> that I keep running into. You can it change it now. <laughs> yeah, is uh, we'll, we'll change it in editing. Um, is anytime I see an app. Uh -huh. Like I download an app, just that I don't know uses Rapid API. Then I realize it uses Rapid API wow. behind the scenes, or I, you know, go to a conference or something and I see some random person with a laptop that's open on the Rapid API stream. That's the highest high that there is. And that's amazing because it's like what you're saying. In other words, is that every time anew, I see the real need for what we bring into the table, like this basic need to have the list of APIs or the cluster that unites all the APIs in the world in the world together in order for other people to make use of it. This is a vision, but it, it comes from a very, very, uh, you know, uh, basic uh, need that you come back to it all the time. And it's really beautiful to see how you describe it, that when you see, I don't know, someone in a coffee shop or in, uh, in the train or in the bus or wherever, in the plane, that uses your platform, it's like something that you're very, wow, I'm proud of yeah, I, I can look at the charts all day and know that there are millions of developers and how much growth we have. And like, you see someone in real life who actually uses the product. Like, uh, at least for me, that's the most exciting thing. You know, that's beautiful, and, and I can see your smile about it because it's something so uh, pure. You know, so from the inside, it's like they are really using what I'm creating. Something that we started, you know, just with an idea, and it grew, grew bigger. So, with the success and with the progress, like new initiatives come or like with the new teams or how do you go bigger and bigger? Uh, th there's a lot of kind of layers that we built mm -hmm. um, over time around the core. So the, the core business very much discovering and collaboration around APIs. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we vetted a lot of tools for building and, and constructing APIs. So that's been a, a major area of focus for us. We launched an API studio as part of our platform. Also bringing the rapid API experience into the enterprise. And all of those are kind of extensions or, or arms that kind of uh, developed around the, the core product. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, again, they, they, it's all kind of harks back to the core to the core of what we do. So currently you have like um, very senior people in the leadership and, and you're building a very big company. How, how do you know, how do you do it? Like to create a very strong, uh, you know, uh, culture, uh, organizational culture, and a strong leadership that will take the company together. And those senses that not necessarily come from experience, but more of a vision and more of, you know, through mentoring, et cetera. So tell me a little bit about the process of building, you know, a company at scale. Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting. There, there are a few things that change at scale. I think early days, for at least for me, it was a lot of just building hands-on keyboard, writing code, designing screens, um, very hands-on. Over time, I, if you kind of today we're 200 people in the company, um, 
I think, and, and we have a phenomenal team of, of individuals here at Rack Air. Um, well, uh, when you ask, uh, like, a senior uh, uh, executive uh, to join you, yeah. and, and, and kind of the question, why would they follow you? Right? I have no, I, I wouldn't. You should ask them. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't ask them the question? No, I, th I think they follow <laughs> the vision and the comment. <laughs> they follow the vision? Yeah, it's, it's despite Edo. Like that, that's <laughs> definitely in the cons <laughs> section. I like this interview. <laughs> <laughs> despite Edo. <laughs> yeah. Edo is not something, but good product, good traction. I'll, I'll, I'll endure good it. Good market. They raise funds. Let's take the risk. Yeah. Let's help him. Yeah. Ex ex <laughs> yeah. I, th I think that's what it is. <laughs> Like it that you need to build that trust. Yeah. But it's not just that, you know, because um, you need also to have a very strong sales um, to deal with all those things. I mean, the, we, we spoke earlier about, um, and we'll get back to the culture, about the game, right? I mean, you have to learn the rules of the game, of the funding, of the uh, uh, recruiting, and it's to a certain stage. And then it changes because you go up in the escape, you go to another round, you need to learn a new rules of the game. And uh, until you know already what you need to do, the game changes. So how do you keep up the pace? How do you, where from do you have the confidence or you don't have the confidence? Uh, th where do the people take the confidence in your decision? How do you manage you know, the, the your uh, executive presence in front of the people uh, that you actually uh, bring to the team with you? That's a great question. A, a lot of trial and error. It really is a, a game that changes a lot. Like you, you play soccer the one minute, and then it's like you raise a, a seed, and then by the time you get to your A, it's a whole different game. Or you you sell to developers, and then you're going to go it's a whole different rules of engagement. Um, I think it's bringing the right people at every stage that are stage adjusted, stage appropriate, have, have been there and done it before, um, and actually having like the the ability to listen to them. Is it something that uh, comes easily to you, like to listen to others and adapt your uh, uh, mindset and, and ways of thinking? No. No, but, but, but I, I, it's a skill that you have to learn, I think. So yeah. you say the, 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 the basics is no. I mean, I have my own vision, idea, and I need to learn how to listen to other. Uh, but, but even I think it's something that took me a while to recognize. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, like. I, I'm the kind of individual who needs, I know that I need people around me who, when they have an opinion, are very comfortable actually pushing it forward. I actually think that, you know, there are some founders who are maybe less opinionated and need people who kind of prop up their opinion a little more. So I think even that is a very kind of personal thing that, that different founders need to recognize and, and, and be conscious of. You chose to go to this uh, journey by yourself. I mean, you started with the idea. It's something that you started to work on, on um, the APIs, on the creating this uh, list of uh, APIs. How do you feel along the journey, although you're not alone today and you have 200 uh, f uh, very, very talented people around you, but still being a founder, it's a very, very lonely position. And so many things you need to handle, so many things you need to manage, so many decisions that you may need to make. How do you hold it all together as a single founder? I think it's, again, it's, 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 it's kind of a, I think it's, it, it, it's a journey that some people work better and end up working better in teams or with co-founders. I've found, at least for me personally, I've, um, at least in the rapid API journey, end up being in a place where I, I think I wor work well alone. And but it's not to say that um, I think there's, you know, especially when the company scales, there's a thing that needs to be understood. It's like maybe they're not co-founder, but they're executives who've been at Rapid for five, six years that are basically like part of the fa like not basic. They're part of the founding team. They're part of the journey, mm -hmm. um, and have have kind of had a pretty significant impact on the company over time. So you gather a very, very talented people around you that help actually uh, help you to co-build the company yeah. and lead it to the right direction. Yeah, and even with some of the, uh, again, uh, as much as I would love to take credit for every single hire we made, it's some of in, in many of the cases, actually, it's been one of our investors who comes and says, like, hey, you need to build out this function. I happen to have just the right guy. Mm -hmm. um, 
and a couple of these hires have been some of the luckiest hires that we, we've ever made as a company. Um, so even there, it's it's kind of having the right people around, like Dov, like Martina and Andreessen, um, like many of the other people that we have on, on the board and, and on the investor um, committee here at Rapid that kind of have the ability to come and, um, and bring in the right people into the company. So often they say the two, two things, uh, two very beautiful things. One is that um, you're very mature and, and you know yourself, you know what works for, for you and what kind of surrounding is right for you to be more productive and more effective and more uh, creative and like to, to create this uh, vision uh, to bring it into this world. Uh, and it's better for you this way, uh, like to be uh, a single founder. On the other hand, you're also saying that it's very important to be very humble and open to listen to those investors around you and or the mentors that really know to reflect you, uh, reflect to you that, listen, you know, now it's the time we have to create this direction or we have to go to this direction and we need to bring these people. It's like to be uh, uh, trusting and open enough and in the other uh, uh, way around, first of all, open and then trusting uh, that this is the right direction to go now and to embrace those uh, decisions and, and new people. It, it also requires, uh, uh, you know, a, a nice amount of, uh, of being, you know, humble uh, to accept all the suggestions that come from outside, but to know how to manage it. Yeah, I, I think there is a fine balance between the two things you're you're saying th they're both true, but it's it's kind of a fine balance because actually one of the things that are maybe wrong or, or problematic in some of our approach to tech companies and startups today is I think there is a lot of kind of common wisdom out there that is kind of taken at face value where the reality is that every company, every founder, every situation, every market is very different. And, and you kind of have to be cognizant of, of where, who you are, what smart you're in, what kind of company you're building, and then kind of qualify in and out what's what's true. Relevant. And, yeah, what's Different. what's right for you and what yeah. isn't. Like, mm -hmm. oh, every company should have multiple co-founder. It's too tough of a journey to walk alone. Mm -hmm. That's true for some companies. It's also not true for many other companies. Mm -hmm. Like, it's good to think about it. It's good to hear that feedback. And I think that goes to your second point of like, hey, having the right people who can provide that feedback, but then still have the kind of cognition to, to qualify for yourself. Definitely. Like, hey, now that I have all this input, what is actually right for us and what isn't right for us? Mm -hmm. And I, I thank you for uh, emphasizing it. It's, it's really crucial. And it takes me back to, to the first point that I always say that the founder, first and foremost, had to uh, know himself in a very, very, or herself, in a very, very deep way, his strengths, values, vision, abilities, skills, in order to know his boundaries, what can he lead by himself, what he needs uh, other people to support him, to complete. And it all begins with knowing who we are, what we are, what do we bring to the table, and how we need to uh, perform. And definitely there's no one uh, you know, uh, recipe uh, that fits all, and it changes according to the market, to the circumstances, to uh, the products. It, it, it really very can be very uh, ver various. Yeah, I mean, y you mentioned values for an for instance, and I think that w one of the mistakes that a lot of, of founders and a lot of companies make when they define values is, A, values are very much like, oh, what is the P2 thing that has to be a company's value? Let's make sure we have that on the list. So it becomes like a very compliant list. Mm -hmm. And then it's also a very aspirational list. Like, we want to be this. We want to be welcoming. We want, like. I see it differently. When I speak about values, I see it as something much more practical. No. Uh, so, so I was gonna say like that. Okay. That's what it ought to be. Like I think it values. If, not, if you're not the, the wall, yeah, that you act according to that. It's really your decision making mechanism is based on this. Yeah. And specifically, like early on, it's the founder. Later on, it's the executive team. But it's yeah. really a reflection of hey, what are our values? Mm -hmm. It's not an as values are not the goal. Mm -hmm. Value is just documenting what you already mm -hmm. do. There's a, I mean, a, the second book by Ben Hor, which is also highly recommended. You are you are what you do. Mm -hmm, exactly. Like, it talks a lot about, A, walking the walk, but also it's a lot easier to walk the walk and it's a lot more natural when the walk is what you actually believe yeah. in. And it's actually, exactly, who you are, what you bring to the world. You don't need to try to be someone else. Just want to be yourself and to work according to this. And, and, and the company that you build around it to yourself is like in, in, in the same direction. 
So I totally, I totally agree with you on this. So how how does it work for you? Like, uh, to how many people do you have in the leadership today? About ten, ten. In, in senior leadership. How does it look like? It's a group of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? <laughs> no, no, I alien, about no aliens. aliens. No dogs. Yeah. <laughs> And we also few dogs that come to the office. Yeah, we have a lot of dogs <laughs> in the office. Yeah, and my dog loves peeing ah, in all the wrong place. Kiwi. 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 I yeah, hope he's no one is in allergic every to corner kiwi. of the of the office. What are your challenges there? Like to work with senior leadership, senior executives that come from um, bankings or other corporates, or you know they bring their insight into the equations, and and how do you manage it there? I think it's, I think the biggest challenge, and it took me a while to recognize, um, is, you know, kind of understanding, hey, if we're, th the company is changing and it's, it's growing over time. And I think that one of the most important, if not the most important role for, for any CEO, and I, f I felt like for me specifically, has been making sure that the executive team scales accordingly, okay. which means, A, either, the execs themselves are growing, learning, and evolving with the company. Like what worked for us yesterday is not going to work for mm -hmm. us tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Or in a lot of cases, making sure that there is up-leveling or bringing in new people um, to kind of adapt where the company is at. And, and it, it, it really is important. Cause I, I've also seen for in, in some cases where I've had API, on the other hand, where we kind of kept on to someone who wasn't growing or uh, wasn't evolving with the company for too long and then you kind of find yourself with a huge gap because you kind of have somebody who was the right person for or the right leader for the company was a year ago um, but isn't isn't the right leader for for where the company is today or is going to be in six months from now so it's beautiful what you said and it's really true and how do you do it for yourself what are the mechanisms that help you grow with the company as a founder and as a ceo how, how do you implement it into your life because at the end or actually at the beginning you need to lead them uh, like you we laughed about it earlier but they need to continue to follow you and it's true that each one has its own domain and they are leading different streams of the company but you're at the top of the pyramid so how do you uh, make sure to always be a few steps ahead to continue inspire your leadership two things and I'm just really good at pretending like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and two, I'm just lucky enough to be right Most enough of times. The time. Yeah, so so it so it looks planned. Well, wait, I need to write it down because it's <laughs> so beautiful. I, I really love love it. And I can reflect and I told you it before because before before we started to record and, and I like it because then things start to come out. I asked you if you feel comfortable. Because I felt that you were a bit tense, you know, towards it. And maybe it just was me. Maybe I was tense. That is up to you. I don't know. It's, it, it was here in the middle. And, and I really like it that you don't take yourself too seriously. At least it looks like that. Yeah. And you, you, you say, I, I, I'm pretending. And I hope it will be okay. And most of the time, the, I mean, it works. The, the luck is with me. And we all know that in order to create a successful startup, one of the most important things you need with us is, is luck. Uh, and we cannot, uh, you know, anticipate it. So, joke aside, but really, um, when you say you're candy, do what? Do you feel like that you're dealing a lot with imposter syndrome, or? I think there's a lot of, and, and I think that this is something that, at least from my experience, has been true for, for a lot of different types mm -hmm. of leadership. Mm -hmm. Of, again, we talk about, like, balances and, and, and kind of walking a line between two extremes. On the one hand, knowing that you may not know the answer and that you're kind of still in exploring mode or open to pivoting down the road. But also, like, when we choose a direction, the whole team has to be aligned around it. Like, it, you, you, it, it's kind of hard to come all the time and say, well, I'm really not sure. I think it's you should go left, but, but maybe. To be I, decisive. Yeah, you have to go right, but also mentally know, well, I'm 70% sure that's the right option. Here are the possible risks or the possible things that we got wrong. Let's check all the time. And hey, if, if in uh, if in two kilometers I figured out it was wrong, I'm also not like not be afraid to come and say, hey, you you know when I said we need to go right? That was bullshit. We're going left now. Mm -hmm. And how do you how do you feel with yourself? Like if there are like, too too many times like the wrong direction, what does it make you feel? Well. 
look, I, there's been many times on the journey when we've been on the wrong direction. I think that there are two questions. A, did we learn something from it? Yeah. And B, if, if you kind of make the same mistake, is it the same kind of failure pr pattern or is it different every time? If it's, hey, we, we like, we failed for one reason, but we solved it and we kind of got to the next level of the game. And now we, we failed again, or we, we need to pivot again slightly, but now it's for a different reason. And now we learned that from that, and we're growing it. That's natural. That's the journey, of, of I think, of every successful company, mm -hmm. where I start getting worried. And, and again, it's the same logic that I try to apply for myself, and I try to apply for people that we work with, is you keep making mistakes, and they're always the same failure mode, the same kind of pattern. Mm -hmm. And I say, like, hey, are we really learning here? Yeah. It's real beautiful um, to listen. Uh, to so much uh, wisdom and matureness, at, and and I, I'm putting it again on the table at a very very young age, and I'm I'm looking at you and I'm listening to you, and I see a lot of founders, and it's really something beautiful to look at uh, that you understand things uh, very early in your journey, um, in a very deep level, and this is exactly when I think about entrepreneurship and the the entrepreneurial mindset in the entrepreneurial DNA. Is those are things that people who don't have it like really need to learn and to embrace this mindset and you know this failure mode and and to d be decisive and then to be able to change and the agility and to be humble to bring people that are better than you and know much better and more experienced and not to be afraid from them but to go together and and like uh, uh, to work quickly it's like very very inspiring uh, to see it and I really hope to see more and more. Uh, young entrepreneurs that embrace this mindset because sometimes it goes to another direction of you know people who are too much full of themselves and like they think that they know but they actually they don't know and i think that being in this uh, uh, uh capacity of you know i'm learning and i'm making mistakes but i'm trying to do ex exactly like you said what did i learn from it is something so crucial to this uh journey and it's really beautiful uh to see that you know, we can. It doesn't matter the age. We we can have it, and we can lead a company, and we can take it uh, to a very, very uh, uh, long and successful journey so far. So, where is Rapid API going? More developers, more APIs, more more developers. S simple. Simple. Yeah. Uh, everything is simple to you. <laughs> what do you do, like in your uh, uh, to balance? You know, sense of urgency or the you know uh, stress pressure the loneliness that you may feel from time to time how do you ventilate it i kill the dog <laughs> <laughs> hi kiwi again yeah <laughs> um it's funny you mentioned urgency it's actually one of our core core kind of core values as a uh -huh. company the sense of urgency it's been sense of urgency yeah um which is uh, it's been an interesting word by the way like to to kind of it's it's not moving fast because uh -huh. it's not yeah. fast it's uh -huh. not speed it's it's I think it's one of the core kind of values for creating a company is having a sense of urgency around solving a problem. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's fun. It's a fun journey. I, I get to, to do cool things. I get to experience things that I could only dream of before. So I don't know. I still I still wake up every morning and enjoy what I do. So I think yeah. that's the, that's that's the balance. Amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Do you take the moment, the take the time from time to time to look back and to reflect and to tell yourself, you know, wow, you did this and that, and you did the this and that, and like to be inspired from it, or just to running uh, forward all the time. I'm looking for it. It's it's one of the I think unique things maybe about kind of company, like launching a company is. It's kind of funny because every big milestone that we hit, again, we talked about kind of years in the making and like or in success. W when we look at like, oh, we just launched with a big customer or we just announced an acquisition or we just announced a huge new project that we launched. I like it's usually something that's been in the works for months, if not years beforehand. So it's very much baked into the price of the stock. Like I, I know that it's coming. I know that it like I always ass I mentally assume that it's gonna be coming out. Now if it if something goes wrong, that's a bummer because that's unexpected. But if okay. everything goes right, it's oh cool, yeah, it went just to plan. <laughs> So that's it? Just, oh, so cool, that's it? Box checked, on <laughs> to the next. <laughs> no big win or not uh, celebrating it, it's just box checked and let's continue? Well, we celebrate, we do celebrate. 
um, we recognize, you know, hard work and, and, and what it took to do it internally. But, you know, I, I think that it's also then interesting to think, cool, what does that unlock for us and what can we do next? Yeah, amazing. What are the new opportunities? That's really beautiful. Ido, thank you so much for uh, joining me today and for, um, you know, opening a very wide and very interesting angle, I think, also today with uh, generations, um, younger people get into tech, into companies, and it's also like bringing a new uh, mood of, uh, and way of operation. And also, like, uh, uh, you as a young CEO also can relay and understand in a better way and in another way, like the young generation that comes uh, to work with you and others, which is also something good because it closes sometimes the cultural gap that we have uh, in different uh, uh, stages. And it's really inspiring to see all the work that you do and um, like mainly on yourself and how to grow and to continue to lead uh, in a very, very high pace uh, company. So thank you very much for joining me today. Is there anything else that you would like to share, to know, to, uh, to say? Just thank you for having me on the show, and I think we had a very interesting conversation. We made it. Yeah, all the <laughs> way to the end. <laughs> all the way uh, to the end. So thanks again for coming. Uh, to our lovely listeners, we're going to hit pause until the next episode. That's also something I say to the entrepreneurs in my clinic in between sessions. If you enjoyed listening, I would really appreciate it if you share the podcast with people who you think would derive value from it. Thanks to the amazing studio at Google Campus that allow me to record all this content in here. Feel free to visit my website at galiblochmiran.com and leave your details there if you wish to be updated and learn more about the mental aspects of job seeking like this. Also, be sure to hit follow my podcast, the Human Founder, in any of your podcast apps. Let's hit pause. Till next time. Thank you, though. Good luck. <laughs>